What's going on? It's Jermaine Smith. I'm here in Harlem. Getting ready to talk to an actor, a good friend, businessman. And he goes by the name of? Roberto Ragon. Roberto Ragon. Welcome to Everyday Talk and Everyday People. Give us a little background about yourself, where you were born, where you grew up, where you schooling. Yeah, so, uh, and by the way, if uh, the people in Italy, right, it's R Roberto Ragone, if you like it, pronounced that way, uh, for authenticity. Yeah, so I'm, uh, um, I was uh, born in a hospital in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue, right, and uh, which is, isn't there anymore, and, uh, but it's across from Central Park where the fountain is and all that, the garden, and I grew up in the Bronx, right, and, uh, and, um, my parents are from Italy, the same town in Italy. I lived there as a little kid, uh, and then I came back to the United States. And it's very funny, because then years later, I saw this Italian film, Cinema Paradiso, where the main character is a little kid, and I felt like I was looking at myself because that little kid looked like me when I was living in Italy. So uh, I felt like, look at me, I'm in, I'm in the movies, you know what I mean? So anyway. How many years did you spend in Italy as a kid? Oh yeah, two and a half years. And then they snuck me back into the United States. They snuck me into kindergarten. Yeah. I only, I only, sp <laughs> I only spoke Italian when I was in there, but then, you know, I kind of learned it through English through immersion. Gotcha. So tell us about growing up in uh, your early years in New York City as a young Italian kid. Well, yeah, no, it's like, you know, it's just because I went to, uh, uh, you know, I went to Catholic school and uh, it was always a very, a diverse area, right? I, I was, I grew up in the part of the Bronx uh, where, um, you know, things were changing, but my area was very uh, sort of integrated kind of at, at that point in time, like Irish, Italian, uh, blacks, uh, you know, African Americans, Puerto Ricans, right? Some Caribbeans, they were primarily Puerto Rican, then not as many of other uh, Latino groups. And, uh, and everybody, like, uh, you know, everybody at that, at the school got along. And maybe, like, uh, the Catholic school made it that much more possible for everybody to kind of get along. But it was a very good experience. And uh, I remember, like, uh, you know, it's funny is that I, I became the minority, right? Because the, 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 the neighborhood became a predominantly African-American, right? But, you know, a lot of times, you know, a person can do one of two things. They could either kind of, like forfeit their own identity and try to blend in or they kind of feel like I'm unique you know and I try to uh, like and try to be more of who you are because you feel like you're being unique so my sister and I we were kind of like that much more kind of proud to be uh, Italian and it was very funny because like some of the kids I think there was this one kid in the neighborhood African-American kid at the school who said to my sister well you guys <laughs> You guys ain't white, you're because you're, you're, you're Italian, and I, I thought that was an interesting uh, uh, thing for us to reflect on about being Italian. So, yeah. So growing up, what were some of your passions as a young man growing up? Over sports, over academics. Can you tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, it's funny because uh, in terms of sports, right? Uh, when I came back from Italy, and I'm going to be, I'm going to date myself, right? I'm in the Bronx, and I don't know which baseball team plays in the Bronx, which baseball team plays in Queens, right? So when I was a kid, everybody liked the Mets, you know, in the Bronx, right? And, uh, and I think all the Yankee fans in the Bronx forgot that they liked the Mets back then. Like Willie Mays was almost retiring and all, was, was about to retire. So I, I became this Met fan, and then later in life, people were like, how, how could you be a Met fan and be in the Bronx? So that became like this thing that I had to kind of hide, right? And then I, and in terms of academics and stuff like that, I always liked uh, history, right? I always took an interest in, in history. I don't know how it first started, but, but then, uh, you know, I kind of liked social studies in school, and then I ended up majoring in... Uh, in uh, history in college, uh, some you know took some political science, some sociology. So I was always uh, so. Then when I became interested in film, I became especially interested in films like yours that had a uh, a history to it. Right, there was a historical context. We're talking about historical figures. So so that's how that you know. 
that sort of explains a lot of my passions, right? So, yeah. Is there a particular project that gave you that actor's bug or writer's bug for film and theater? That's a good, uh, that's a good question, right? Um, you know, I, I had been doing uh, theater uh, while I was working in government and public policy and nonprofits. And I organized this big event on a, on a congressman, uh, Vito Marcantonio, right, who was, uh, I had heard of, it was interesting because throughout college, he kept coming up in my life, right? For, I actually first heard of him in an African-American history class because he uh, opposed, uh, he, he was 1930s and 40s, so he proposed legislation against lynching to make a federal crime, a crime to, to make the poll tax uh, illegal. He was big on racial harmony, like advancing civil rights way ahead of his time. He was LaGuardia's uh, protege. And I, you know, I was, I took an interest in him and he always kept coming up in my life. So in 1998 then, I organized this big event where 400 people showed up. And the guy, this professor friend who was kind of a mentor to me, like, he said to me, we can't make this a one-off. We got to do other things like walking tours and, and lectures. And then when he said, when he said documentaries and a film, I said, I want to do the film, right? That's when I was like, that's when I became passionate about the idea of not only doing theater again, but even also doing screen stuff. Because I could imagine a movie about him on the screen because Vito Marcantonio was everything, I always tell people, he's everything that you liked about Vito Corleone and The Godfather, but on the right side of the law because he's like every, every, giving everybody favors, everybody's coming to the neighborhood to him for favors and he's helping everybody out but he's building credibility so that he could take these controversial stands like for civil rights and against the Korean War and things like that. So that was like, that was my thing. That was the big passionate thing that continues to be my my mission when I do uh, film and theater. Gotcha. Take yeah. us through that, um, that feeling of being on stage. What is it like to an actor that may have not been on stage or to someone that doesn't act? Right. What is that feeling of being on stage in front of people? Well, that's the, you know, what's interesting is that I, I've been hearing uh, a couple of people, like including uh, Amy Jo Berman, who's a casting director, uh, uh, used to be a casting director for HBO and teaches the classes about acting, including mindset, and this guy named Simon Sinek, who also, and they say the same thing, that, that uh, what the feeling of nervousness, right, uh, the same sensations and stimuli are also the same for excitement. So a lot of times an actor, particularly in theater, has that excitement because you memorized your lines, right? There's no turning back. If you forget your lines, you got to figure it. You got to figure out what to do. Or should you, uh, you know, should you, uh, you know, forget your lines or work your way through your performing before a live audience? It becomes different every night. So it's very exciting because you're using, uh, you know, like you're, you, you've done all these rehearsals. You've, you've really explored the character. You've explored the subtext. You're like you're projecting yourself physically. You're projecting your voice, and you're really bringing out the character. And and then you're discovering something new about the character every time you perform it. And a lot of the, one feeling that a lot of actors uh, have who's performed on stage is that that very last day of the performance, they feel like they made the biggest discoveries, and and they won't be able to perform that next performance with that discovery because they kind of discovered it at the end. But that's, it's a very interesting evolution when you do these performances and they're very exciting. So, okay. yeah. Interesting. Right. What's your big, your big feeling, your big, the big difference to you between theater and film? That's, uh, with the, well, first of all, what's good about theater is that it gets you in the habit of memorizing your lines, right? And it also, it also uh, trains uh, your voice uh, to project. But the, I think the difference is that, uh, and I'm sure you've heard other people say it to you too, is that when you, um, when you uh, and this is a challenge for theater actors, is that when you do screen stuff, right, you gotta pull back, right? You gotta pull back the energy just a little bit because the, um, the, a lot of what you're trying to convey, you're trying to convey through facial expressions, right? And you're trying to, uh, I guess, to limit uh, the, the 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 hand gestures without uh, without looking too constrained and stiff, right? I mean, you know that as a director, right? So uh, that's why we always look to you for feedback on a 
for every take, right, to make sure that, you know, we're doing it the way you want it and that it's not too theatrical and so on, right? So, how's my eye contact, by the way? Yeah, great, great. Uh, good, good. So make this like a reality show, right? Anyway, go ahead. Political background and how did you prepare for your role in coming from the team? Yeah, you know, well, I'll tell you this, because I was a history major, right, and I, I would like to point out, I studied African-American history. There was a course in African-American, and a course on African-American poetry, so I always felt like I was very immersed in that history. And, I, and because I also, I kind of like, I very, like, my favorite part of American history is always the 1930s uh, to especially the early 1960s, right, which is that, that period uh, where... Uh, in 1963, where Martin Luther King gives the I, uh, the, uh, I Have a Dream speech and it then, you know, John F. Kennedy's assassinated, I always felt like that I, I felt very ready to do a film about King because I studied that history. Remember, you and I were talking about, you and I were talking about the height of his success uh, where uh, when he dealt with, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the protests in 63 where uh, the, uh, um, What's his name? Sheriff Bull Connor went too far, and with between the hoses and the dogs and the cameras and, and TV being new and everybody seeing exactly how African Americans were being treated, that was the big turning point of success for for uh, Dr. King and uh, and then all the dilemmas on the bridge. You know the I I, I the the I can't pronounce Pettis? the Pettus Bridge, right? I always I always forget how to pronounce that. The Pettus Bridge and whether he has to whether he should cross or not, and some people felt like he should, and some people felt like he should. So this was all your, the time frame of your film was kind of perfect because it was like he had he had reached the crescendo, and then you're trying to see, you're, you're noticing that it's not a straightforward uh, thing because there were people plotting and planning, not only in the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, but, you know, people within uh, uh, his own uh, community, you know, there's uh, there's always the the people at uh, Carmichael at uh, at uh, Stokely Carmichael at uh, at uh, SNCC who uh, S S N I can't remember LCLC LC, right LCLC LC, right S, right exactly who can't uh, who feels like uh, that uh, that the incrementalism isn't enough so I felt like I knew it all right and that sometimes when you know the history that is that is an important part of the subtext right. And then I had learned a lot about uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover himself and the culture he had created at the FBI, uh, where, you know, like in all the files and this and that, and his, he's trying to set people up. I mean, I, you know, even, even with my own projects, like the, the fact that the FBI had a file on Vito Marcantonio, and that once he lost his congressional seat, they were going to mark it, mark it ex-decom, meaning like if the president declares a national emergency, you could round them up and accuse them of communism. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a similar type of protocol with, uh, with Martin Luther King. So, um, so it was all, I felt very ready to play that role, the racist FBI agent. It was all, it was all there, so yeah. Is there any special technique you can share with another actor or an up and coming actor to how you prepare for this role and coming to the King? Yeah, well, again, it's the the it's the research and the and the and the knowing, right? In terms of like the line delivery, you know, what's interesting is that I like the southern accent, uh, where uh, and again, I I was like I was looking to you to to make sure that the uh, the southern accent sounded authentic and and you seemed to to like it, right? But we first uh, talked about whether I should do like a like a, a Bull Connor, but uh, and he had a very choppy way, but then. I kind of, like, I, let's put it this way, with, in, in answer to your question, I think that the people would, you know, there's always the miser technique where you kind of repeat the lines uh, over and over uh, to yourself or to, uh, to someone else to kind of like, uh, to, pre to really prepare. Uh, uh, very important, like of all the films I've done with you, right, the, 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 the scenes that we did, where we did like the read just before we did the scene, I think we did that more with this 
than with the with others. So like the the repetition and the practicing of the lines with everybody, particularly just before, is sort of like a it's it's almost like very Meisner esque, right? So everybody's preparing. But then in the end, it, it also like when you when you want to say a line, right? When you want to get into that situation, you could you could think of like conversations you've had in the past where where you've like either had to dealt, deal with people that way, right? Or something that gave you that same emotional feeling. Or something that made you want to say that sentence in, in a similar way to somebody, right? So that you're basically saying that sentence again like you said it to that other person, right? Or that, have that attitude like you had with that other person. And then when you convey that, then it starts to feel like, you know, then you, you kind of uh, make it natural, right? Because people, with the, what I've learned is um, that you don't try to go out of your way to create a character. You try to find the truth of yourself. Uh, you try to find that truth, the truth of that character in yourself, right? So, uh, and, and that's how you end up sounding natural, right? So I think that, you know, those are all the ki kinds of things that, uh, an actor could do to, to, to prepare for a role, you know, I, that's, you know, if that helps, if that answers your question, right, so yeah. So if you can name one male actor that you would love to work with and one female actor that you would love to work with, who would each one of those be? You know, that's, man, that's a tough one. Uh, and you know, it's funny, I watched some of your other interviews and I said, I have to prepare, because you, you, you have this question about who would you give flowers to, right? I think uh, I would like to work with, uh, uh, for the male actors, I think I want to work with uh, Al Pacino and even uh, Daniel Day-Lewis because, you know, I saw Daniel Day-Lewis in, uh, in Al Pacino in all these different roles. I feel like I would like to play opposite him in something, all right, where I think he and I would have a very good dynamic, right? I mean, it's like, well, a lot of these guys, I feel like I, I wish I, well, a lot of these Italian actors, I feel like I'd like to do some kind of a, uh, like Italian-American Woody Allen comedy with them, right? But Daniel Day-Lewis was interesting because he was in, uh, I think, Gangs of New York, right? And um, I hope I got that right, right? And he was uh, playing a, a character, and what's interesting is that he was, it's, it's 1850s New York, right? And he's talking in a way where you could almost hear a trace of the beginnings of what would become a New York accent, right? So I felt like, Here's a you know a guy who really looks at his craft and all that. So so that in terms of a female uh, actress, um, like an actress, uh, that's a good question. I mean uh, the uh, I mean is there's a I, I need a moment with that. I, I you know like in the, I know that I I would you know it's um, I need a you might want to pause the tape while I while I think about that one. But uh, I think uh, you know. Um, uh, uh, you know, what's interesting is I always thought that Drew Barrymore, for instance, I always felt like that she uh, uh, wasn't. Uh, uh, I always felt like that there was more that uh, that she could have gotten, right? Uh, and uh, I, I feel like she's underrecognized. I saw her play uh, the, uh, this, the the daughter of a, a woman who was uh, a Jackie Kennedy's cousin. It was called Grey Gardens, and how they were like um, they they. They became like a very dysfunctional family that always left the house cluttered. And I thought that she did such a great job with that and other things. I feel like that uh, that I'd like to work with Drew Barrymore. You know what I mean? And do and do something with her that really uh, that we're we're kind of like getting elevated by the story. You know what I mean? So anyway, yeah. So now you know the question. Who would you give your flowers to in less than thirty seconds? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think I would give them to Pacino partly because, like, here's a guy who who he 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 had a, a streak of films that he was so good in in the 70s, right? And he got nominated for Academy Awards, right? I'd, pro I'd probably give him to to, to Pacino and to Scorsese because these people have achieved, right? And yet they 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 either were nominated for Academy Awards and then they never won. So it's like, it's so weird that there are people who got more Oscars than them, but these guys are so well-deserving of awards, but they just goes to show that 
like in the years to come, they're always going to be remembered uh, for their accomplishments, regardless of the amount of awards that they win or they were cheated out of or whatever. So my rose is to them. Yeah. How can people reach you going out? How can people reach you on social media or any particular platform? Yeah, I, well, on Instagram, I'm Roberto, R-O-B-E-R-T-O, -E Ragone, R-A-G-O-N-E, five, the number five, right? Um, I'm, I'm on Facebook, but uh, my fan page is uh, facebook.com dot R-E-A-P Ragone, reapragone.com, and uh, you can see a lot of videos that I've done, clips from films, your films, other films, my, my, uh, my, my rants, my satirical rants, and um, let's see. Uh, I guess so. What else? What else do people provide? The email address? No, right? Just. Uh, I mean, those are the two main uh, social media uh, uh, um, ways of getting in touch with me. All right. right. You have it. Thank you. All of New York, we're going to we're going All right. for the king. Have a great one. Thank you. Thanks for having me. concerned about the power of those I'm fighting. I'm more concerned with my people and the liberties. Their liberties? I refuse to fight and go to the depths of shame that Director Hoover has While Hoover spares no cause to break you? Telling all the press that you're some lying, negro-ass feature. I don't want this blood money. Nigga, you listen to me. You, there are more people out the quiet king than you think. Mm -hmm. And we have people. Freedom inside. Freedom. Spread out across my chest. And if I die, then I praise my cause of death. 